Hello friends, hope all of you are doing well. In today's session, we are going to discuss one more sonnet of Edmund Spencer from his collection of sonnets that is Amrithi, that is Sonnet 67. Prior to this, I have discussed Sonnet 34 as well, which is included in the syllabus of MHE 1 British Poetry and so is Sonnet 67, which is very important from examination perspective. So today's sonnet that is sonnet 67 also goes by the name like as a huntsman is a very interesting sonnet and as the concept of sonnet goes it consists of three quatrains and a final couplet that is a total of 14 lines. So those of you who have not watched my previous video on sonnet 34 I highly recommend that you watch that video so that you can understand the concept behind the collection of sonnets that was penned down by Edmund Spencer for his beloved Elizabeth Boyle in order to impress her, in order to woo her and now without any further ado let's get started with the video. So let us start with the first quatrain that is the first four lines of the sonnet. It goes something like this. Like as a huntsman after very chase seeing the game from him escaped away sits down to rest him in some shady place with panting hounds beguiled of their prey. Now here we have to understand that the lover says that earlier his condition was like a hunter. Edmund Spencer is particularly comparing himself to the condition of a hunter where the hunter is after its prey, it's chasing the prey in order to trap her. Now what happens is that after a very chase and after having ultimately realized that the prey, here again one thing that you need to know here is that the prey actually symbolizes the love of Edmund Spencer, that is the beloved of Edmund Spencer, that is Elizabeth Boyle. Now here after the hunter has realized that the prey has escaped away, he sits down to rest in some shady place. Alright, that means he is tired, chasing the prey and eventually realizing that the prey is beyond his scope, he sh takes some rest in some shady place. Now the final line that we see in the first quatrain that says, with panting hounds beguiled of their prey, we have to understand first of all that the hounds means a dog of a breed usually used for hunting. Okay. Now this particular breed is actually used by the hunters to hunt their prey. Okay. They are very ferocious type of dogs, a very ferocious type of dog breed it is and here the word begil means charm or enchant someone fine often in a deceptive way so it's a negative word. so the second quatrain starts with the line so after long pursuit and vain essay when i all weary had the chase forsook the gentle deer returned the self same way thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook. Now the second quatrain, what happens is that Edmund Spencer is showing the virtue of patience here. So what happens that after a long pursuit, we have seen in the first quatrain that the hunter is very tired chasing its prey and eventually he decides to take rest. So after the long pursuit, when the hunter was tired and had given up or forsaken the game, he sees the gentle deer. That means here the deer is compared to Elizabeth Boyle. Fine. That is the deer is the beloved. Now the deer returns the same way to quench her thirst at the next brook. Now we know that the word quench it symbolizes it means to satisfy one's thirst by drinking and the word brook it means a small stream. Now let me explain this second quatrain in very simple words that means in the first quatrain we have seen the first four lines we have observed that the hunter is very much tired and the hunter is uh, hunter is none other than actually Edmund Spencer and he is actually pursuing his love his beloved that is Elizabeth Boyle and after he is tired chasing her when he sits for some time in a shady place eventually what happens is that the deer comes back, okay, it comes back near him in order to quench her thirst at the next brook, that means near the next small stream. Coming to the last quatrain which goes something like this, There she beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still did bite, till I in hand her yet half trembling look, and with her good will her firmly tied. Now this final quatrain is very very important in this particular sonnet because here what happens is that deer which is actually now having some water near a brook there she is looking at the hunter with a gentle looks okay she did not fly away that means she was near the hunter and she was not going away and she was fearless she was not afraid but she remained there without any fear till the hunter 
actually catches her it she he actually manages to get hold of her and he firmly ties her with her own goodwill now here we sense a sense of optimism actually by edmund spencer where he's speaking a uh, volumes about the virtue of patience that means eventually when the hunter was tired that we have seen in the first four lines he sits near a shady place and where he sees that when he was he has given up or he has forsaken the idea of you know catching up the prey eventually the deer shows up near him to quench her thirst near a nearby brook and when the deer watches the hunter she was totally fearless okay she was not afraid of the hunter till what happens is the hunter get holds of the deer in a good sense of good goodwill all right so it's a very beautiful sonnet now let's go quickly to the final couplet of the sonnet Now the final couplet goes something like this strange thing me seemed to see a beast so wild so goodly worn with her own will pickled now here what edmund spencer is trying to say is that he was quite mesmerized and he was quite surprised that how come a beast can be tamed so easily okay that means the deer lives in a wild and we know that the deer actually represents here elizabeth poyle and the hunter is actually a personification of edmund spencer so we'll talk about the figures of speech later on let's focus in the final two lines so here he is trying to say the author the poet edmund spencer is trying to say that how the wildly beast is so easily won so goodly won okay there is a sense of goodwill here he is also indicating he is also giving a hint that perhaps she was beguiled by her own will okay that means by her own desire that means the ultimate submission that was given by the deer might be because of her own desire now if we discuss about what is the central metaphor in the sonnet like as a huntsman we have to understand that adben spencer very famously and very popularly used the figure of speeches as i have discussed in the previous session that is of sonnet 34 where he has used some beautiful figures of speeches like metaphors simile and personification the same thing he has done here the whole poem uses a metaphor since the topic is a man trying to win the love of his life but in this sonnet the love of his life is a deer and the man is a hunter also since in the reality the deer is the love of his life and the sonnet refers to the deer as a female as i mentioned that the deer actually represents here elizabeth poyle and the hunter is actually the personification of edmund spencer so as i've told you that the literary device that is used here is personification where the deer symbolizes Ad- elizabeth poyle and the hunter is actually none other than edmund spencer now as i mentioned in the beginning of the session that this particular sonnet that is sonnet 67 is very very important from examination perspective and also from the point of view that edmund spencer has actually created a thematic split with the help of sonnet 67 that means up until sonnet 67 the sonnet's primarily focuses on the frustration of unreturned romantic desires now by sonnet 34 and by sonnet 67 we have already understood that here actually what is happening is that edmund spencer is trying to pursue his love he is trying to impress elizabeth poyle but he is not getting the desired result okay he is not getting the romantic reply so on other hand the sonnets that follow sonnet 67 celebrates the happiness of love shared between two people that is edmund spencer and elizabeth poyle as well as celebrating divine love so this is the video guys i hope you had an insight regarding this particular sonnet and this is very very important because as i have mentioned in the end of the video that this particular sonnet marks the thematic split in the collection of sonnets that he has written that is around 89 sonnets that is included in the collection and that is named as amorethi so if you have any other doubt regarding this particular sonnet or any other piece of work in mg1 british poetry do feel free to comment in the comment section i'll definitely try to address it Till we meet next time. God bless you and thank you all.